Hello and welcome to the King Hero's Journey. <laughs> so fun I get to do this today. Yay, Clayton Jacobs is here already. Too, you got too much sun and you had a quick uh, nap and you'll be back. Okay, excellent. And uh, I'm just going to start Rockfin. So for any of you out there that like to go on Rockfin, then um, we are uh, going to be on there as well. And interestingly you used to hit have to hit live and now it looks live so if anybody wants to jump on there here is a link to the rockfin you're most welcome to give that a try and just let me know if it looks live looks live to me and uh so we have uh chance garden on today pretty excited because i only get to talk to him live on streams <laughs> we have become good buddies and uh, both of our lives got really intensely busy so i'm bringing chance on now Hello, hey, Jens. Beth. Hey, nice to see you. So great to have you here. I feel the same way that I'm excited to get to do these because we can actually spend time talking to each other for an extended period. I know. I know exactly. It's become a very strange thing where, I mean, just to start it off, we're going to talk about stealth and grace today. And this is a subject that that came forward from a tarot reading. Chance does, I don't know if you do them every single day, but very frequent tarot readings. And uh, and th this one was about stealth, right? This is something that podcasters have a hard time with, <laughs> right? Because it's a constant drive to um, not create content, you know, but it's to reflect content that life is going on, things are happening, there's developments, and that all becomes part of the you know, I want to use the narrative word, but of course that's highly weaponized against us now, but it just becomes part of the story of your continuation of, of being in, in the public eye and having value to offer. So, uh, you know, when things come up that I can't talk about, it's like, oh man, I'm, I'm biting my tongue and sitting on my hands and, and it's crazy. But, uh, but there are times for, for this quality to really come forward and, and have it turn into grace and then okay yeah so rockfin is a weird weirdo now okay it should be live even though it told me i i was live before all right and uh so we're gonna go through the ins and the outs of it i know there's lots of archetypal energy at play here uh there there's as usual it's not going to be a surprise to you guys uh oh thank you joseph I, he says i'm glam today chance <laughs> that's fun so i wear something different and, uh, you know, so there's a shadow and a conscious side to everything, absolutely everything. And that's kind of confronting sometimes because otherwise you think, oh, well, there is a good path. I'll just take that path and I'll be on it and, and I won't have to give it any more consideration or thought. But, uh, you know, that's if, I, if I'm learning anything these days, it's it's really not the case. It doesn't matter what subject you're in, you, you know, health. Uh, relationships, law, for example, that's a big one right now. And uh, so I'll just say hello to a few people. Malcolm Berkeley is here. Hello. I don't know what time it is there. Oh, it's probably your morning now. <clears throat> Mike New is here. Unrealistic Cliff Burton. And I'll have to put Joseph's comment up, up again that I look glam and they like my biceps. I don't know what that is. <laughs> I have been working out, I tell you, lugging water. We're in a drought, Chance. It's a total drought. We've had years already, but now it's uh, it's over the top and nothing gets to live if you don't physically water it these days. So that's the end of my sad, sad story about that. And welcome, Chance. I'm so glad to have you here. Yeah, I'm really glad to be here, too. And I love doing these as a live stream. I haven't got to do live content for a while. Life's been very hectic and busy. And as far as the tarot readings you're talking about, those are on Telegram. I usually forward them over to your group, too, because we have so many shared friends between our audiences. But yeah, the last week I had an altar space where my decks were set up. And so every morning I draw one from three different decks that I like quite a bit. And actually, I'm going to be taking a little bit of information that we are going to talk about today out of one of those decks, which is an animal medicine like Native American type of spiritual deck. And that was that one's really cool. There are different animals in each one. And interestingly enough, the 33rd card in that deck is the stealth card, which is the weasel. So we can talk about that. But I think it's kind of interesting <laughs> that that's number 33, since there's a lot of stealthy use of that particular number embedded in 
mind control media out there. Yeah, and the drought thing, it's just wild because we've known for a hundred years at least that if we have technology to get into the air, like airplanes, then we can make it rain. It's very doable, very simple, tons of methods to do it. There are companies you can, like, I always thought this was hilarious that actually kind of in a sad way that in California where they've been just fried with drought after drought year after year and fires and all that, there are places that don't get any water where only a few miles away in the mountains, there are ski resorts that hire companies to cloud seed and make it snow early on the mountain. And somehow that's just not like, I don't know why people don't that live in those areas don't just get together the money and pool it up and hire one of these cloud seeding companies or figure out a way to just do that. Because it I seems know. like it would be, if they can manipulate the weather for bad, maybe we could at least do some simple things that aren't that invasive, like making it rain. But maybe I don't know enough about it. Maybe we should just not mess with it at all. But yeah, <laughs> that's a whole tangent. Thanks for linking the telegram chats there too. Uh, yeah, so morning. yeah, I like to do those morning reads and it's mind blowing how between the I Ching, the traditional tarot and the animal medicine cards, there's always an amazing linkage that seemed to make each card explain the meaning and the specificity of the other cards more directly. And that's fun because everyone in the group that participates in checking out those reads, I think we, I, I like to say that those in the know together flow together. And it does feel like for those of us that are tuned in to great spirit or God or just our inner energetic system, that we do seem to feel and experience things that are at least thematically or emotionally linked from life to life, even across huge distances. I just saw Jenny B in the chat. You know it's good <laughs> when Jenny's in the, in the nice. chat. Yeah, welcome to everybody. Oh, they just love my biceps. It's fun. <laughs> Bicep people. Are weird. What about my biceps? I, I did. <laughs> I know. Well, chance we can I actually see lifted weights yesterday for my biceps, guys. Come on. They just <laughs> there love you. There you go. Yeah, bicep okay. people are weird. I'm starting to block a few. No, no offense, but it's uh, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> and I have to go back to the uh, the cloud seeding thing. So yeah, this has been on the books since I believe 1947. It's nothing new. When people call it uh, conspiracy, it's it's BS. And our premier, I know some of you have heard me say this already. Welcome to everybody new on this channel, by the way. It's been growing, and I totally appreciate your, your uh, interest and support. But our, our premier came on. He is, he is like the, you know, the, the head guy in Manitoba, if you're not familiar with Canadian politics. And so he co comes on to a uh, press release, and he says to people, while he's being asked about, now I'm going to be careful here because I'm, I'm still in good standing on this uh, platform, but people were asking about treatments and why are we um, doing emergency use authorization for an injection when there are treatments, right? And so he completely evaded the question, said, oh, yes, we have the biggest pharmaceutical industry in the whole country. So doesn't doesn't even address it, just is talking about our industry. And then he looks at the camera direct and he says, thank you for the rain. That was a billion dollar rain. And then he puts on his mask and he walks away. And and I'm thinking, OK, he lost I remember it. seeing that. You, you did. Yeah, it went around. There was a lot of lot of views on that. And I thought, OK, the guy's dissociated. He's done. There's just he's, he's not there anymore. And it's like, no, no, he's talking to the controllers. Thank you for the rain. Thank you for spraying the crap out of the skies and uh, and bringing a, a rain to salvage because the economy will die dead. You know, many people will suffer if we remain in this level of drought. So you know like it, it's just it's just proof they're 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 yes the guy's uh in my estimate a psychopath but is he that primary psychopath or is is he literally being held up against his will they hijacked him but they have stuff on him like you know so anyway i i know they're we're not here exactly to talk about that yeah but that's all fitting into the concept of what can happen when things are concealed because I did want to discuss both the virtues and vices of this idea of stealth or hiding or camouflage. There's a lot of words that we can explore that relate to the topic. And yeah, with those 33 years, we do see that pattern of getting somebody to go through an initiatory rite of some kind or get access by 
participating in something weird and then now you've got blackmail dirt on them and i guess it's really effective because it's been going on and on i think the dudes being held up that does seem to be the case for most in the limelight or the spotlight especially during all these dumb things going on the last two years but yeah <laughs> i know it's insane in the limelight or the spotlight especially sorry about that. i hear myself yep sorry about that I'm just going to try to do a little damage control over here and uh, give uh, Amanda a uh, a wrench and a few others a wrench. And if you can help control the uh, comments on my physicality, that would be awesome. Just uh, delete their comments and then I will. This will be sort of a last chance. I prefer not to have those at all. Yeah, that's so, just bizarre. Yeah. yeah <laughs> I will. I mean, you know, my, mm -hmm. my appearance was commented on the Spider-Man shirt. I feel like that's a fun place to start while you're doing your wrenching. <laughs> okay, because you pick the spider for the cover art for this post before it went up. Right. And I thought that's so appropriate. I'm going to wear my best and only no, I think I have two Spider-Man shirts, but this is like my fanciest one. Because that's actually, as uh, Joseph said in the chat, that's a King's hero for sure. I tend to think that of all the superheroes that are held up by, you know, the mass media, Spider-Man's one of the less damaging archetypes to go with because he has a lot of good qualities. Even the 90s cartoon version of Spider-Man that I grew up watching, I didn't realize this as a kid, but very unlike, say, Batman or the other superheroes that are hyper violent, the 90s cartoon of Spider-Man, the entire series run, he never throws a punch at anybody. He never tries to physically harm any bad guys. All he does is evade their attacks and restrain them in some way. Like he might tackle them or web them up, but I thought that was mind blowing. I mean, maybe that had something to do with cartoon censorship back then, but I think it fits the character really well. And he has this stealth quality of being able to climb around on the ceiling and see things from an upside down perspective. But another aspect of the spider, which is also something that's important in the stealth category in the sense of this is generally an activity that goes on when we're by ourselves and that other people are watching is the concept of the taming power of the small or working on what has been spoiled. Both of these are eaching. Uh, concepts and the taming power of the small specifically at least in the book that I've got has a picture of a spider on its web and why this relates to spider-man is it has to do with taking care of what needs to be taken care of no matter how big or small of a deal it is so as a superhero mm -hmm. with this metaphor to continue he might go out there and save the entire world from something huge but he never passes by even the smallest thing that needs his attention that needs help and then, yeah, there's the concept of Spidey Sense having to do with intuition, and he operates on intuition. All in all, other than the Hollywood versions that brutalize everything that they do, <laughs> uh, that character is pretty cool, at least conceptually. And then co always, all this ties back into the Spider-Man motto, which is, with great power comes great responsibility. And I personally took that to heart by getting a spider tattoo on my forearm oh, that wow. is a <laughs> oh my gosh look at that it looks kind of scary i guess i did this when i was like in my early 20s and i realize now that like a big black spider might make people really wonder like what's this dude about but for me it's all about what i just said and it's a i can always see it always remind myself that we have great power and so that taming power of the smaller work on what has been spoiled Part of our power is what we do in the dark or what we do alone and how that does or doesn't affect us positively or negatively. How, you know, you might seem like you've got everything really together on the outside. You're really good at self-promotion. <laughs> That's a podcaster thing. It's a tough thing, actually. Mm -hmm. And on the inside or like in your house, maybe everything could be totally upside down. I'm actually in that place right now because I've gone through a bunch of moving things in my house and reorganizing and it's a long, slow process and you have to be able to keep chipping away at it and not put it off. But that's the thing It's you know, people like us and people on the stage, people on YouTube videos, they could seem like they've really got their stuff together, that they are very, it's like the medium becomes a message like that Marshall McClure book and what is going on in their personal life 
I, it's not necessarily like you need to let the message or defeat the message, but sometimes when you follow somebody long enough, the things start to come through the cracks and you can pay attention and your spidey sense might tell you, Hey, maybe this isn't actually a great individual to idolize. Uh, maybe what they do off the screen is harmful to other people. I'm thinking, mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm thinking of a certain particular person I'm not going to name, but mm-hmm. anyway, <laughs> <laughs> that, that's the proof in the pudding, Chance, exactly, because I, I, it used to happen to me all the time. I would idolize some often musician in my in my younger days, and, uh, you know, I'd follow them around, and I'd, I'd make a point to go and, and meet them at a, at a concert, and then they would be like an asshole, and then I'd be like, oh, I, I'm done with your music. I cannot now reconcile, balance these books inside my head from this person I've created to... <clears throat> the person that you just dis- displayed yourself to be, even in a bad moment still, right? Like you shouldn't be diametrically opposed uh, personas. And that's that's what the world is, has done to us, invited us into persona. So we're always presenting something. And then when I meet somebody, you know, I, I consider you to be one of those that you are the same on and off air, right? And we might not, it doesn't mean you come out and, and uh, spill your guts on air or tell them every little problem you have or every little cobweb you haven't cleaned out of your uh, closet. It's, it's about, you know, actually the best measure of is like, well, what is going to be usable and useful for people? You know, is it useful for them to know that I'm struggling on all these fronts? And I love that point about the spider, like that, that little things are to be handled. There's lots of big picture people who don't handle the little stuff and it gets away on them. Uh, so, you know, there's, it, it's, it's a very complex, that, that's why I, I, even against the odds in, the, in the, the time that we both have, I knew we needed to have this conversation today. Absolutely. And the little things making up the big things, that is definitely the image of the spider web. And Another cool thing about like to continue talking about spider as a good archetype for this concept of stealth to kick us off because actually I have plenty of other animals to discuss that have messages for us, which is fun. And that was like the only notes I put together were a few animals and the native myths that I know about them, little anecdotes that can inform us. But the spider web, interestingly enough, you don't often see the spider building the web it's usually like you come outside to your front porch one morning and all of a sudden there's just this huge incredible web and so these things work in the dark they work quickly and methodically i even found out a little bit about how spiders spin their webs and it has something to do with the air and they do some sort of chemical alchemical thing in their spinner sack like they don't carry around all that web with them it's like they somehow transmute the materials into the web as they're going. I could be wrong about that, but as far as I know, it's a very mysterious process. And we see the resilience in that particular structure all the time in the form of the many consumer products that have been developed by analyzing the spider web. So perfect example of how a small thing can make great things in Mm -hmm. the form of the web itself and also how powerful the tensile strength of spider silk can be. It's very fascinating. Right. And it's accessing the invisible. So I was reading in the uh, Zodiac and the Salts of Salvation, how the bulk of, see, when you, you plant something, we're all, we're all obsessed with the soil. And then, and then they tell us, oh, the soil's going away and and we're not going to be able to have food anymore because of that. Well, the bulk of the plant is not coming from the soil. It's coming from the air the invisible. It's, it's drawing. Now, it doesn't make your soil irrelevant, uh, but it's a matrix. It's, it's a holding place. I had chia tried to grow um, inside the little crevice of my fridge because I had a major chia accident, didn't clean up all of it. And all of a sudden, I'm seeing these sprouts and I'm like, what the heck? Right? There's no soil in there. In fact, that that seed created soil. You could see there was like, a, you know, what looked to be soil at, at the base of the root. Uh, So it's something else going on. That was in the dark over, I don't know, a month or two that it got up its gumption and took from the air the will to grow. 
So, it's, it's, it, you know, just, just to point out, it's the power of the invisible that we're not seeing, and that is what we're talking about. That's stealth. <laughs> yeah, and even that makes me think of insects and how in previous times, learned men believed that if you left out like rotting food, that insects that would eat that food would actually emerge out of the ether, basically. And that that was actually where they were coming from. And it makes you wonder, I'm not saying that the scientific materialist biology schools have everything totally wrong, but I wonder about that concept sometimes because I've come home from being out of town for a while, like five days or something. The house is completely sealed up. There's not really, there's like maybe one piece of trash that is food and you come back and all of a sudden your whole house is full of these fruit flies. Like makes you wonder. I mean, I guess they could come in from the outside, but there is this incredible thing that nature does where when you're not looking, life just pops out of nowhere and it's already there fully formed. And now you have a whole swarm of them to deal with. And I think that's part of the virtue of stealth that we're going to be maybe discussing next. It feels right, which is that the best way to deliver something in terms of a creation is when it's complete and not before it's complete. And so na nature does work that way. Like you, you don't exactly see the plant growing, right? You come, you come back and now it's a little bigger, even sometimes very much bigger. It's going through these transformations when in the place where we're not conscious of it, where we're not exactly looking. So that's kind of a cool metaphor for how really everything is emerging out of the void or out of the unconscious or out of the feminine, out of the soil. And, yeah, hydroponics, that's fascinating. I never really thought about how maybe they could make their own soil to a degree, but that's a cool story. I've uh, It also tells you just how easy it would be to have more food if we were doing the microgreens sprouting thing in all of our, in all the open space we could fit in our house. Like that's a ton of food, super powerful food as well. Exactly. And uh, Malcolm's saying worms come out of the, the nowhere in the compost. And, and uh, if, you, if you go back to Berlando's work, he's talking about, and he went, he's not the only one who does, but pleomorphism. And it's the same thing. When I neglect the cat station, I call it, like where all the cat things are, food and water and crunchies and several flavors of wet food. And they're just I've got one of those. I got yeah, a cat station. Yeah. Right, right. And so, you know, if I, if I don't look under everything and clean under everything on a regular basis, it, it, it pops up with a certain kind of insect that I never see anywhere else all my life, never. And it came out of the food, right? Like it, it, it's the, the we've, we've got this cleanup crew. God has taken care of every stage, not just, not just the, the, the birth of the seed and the germination and the sprout and the plant, but also the means to clean it up. It's all contained in there. Same thing, you know, left the chicken outside. I come in the spring and uh, it's all maggots, right? Like they didn't, call, they didn't crawl over the balcony looking for rotten chicken, <laughs> right? So it's, it's so different than we've ever been taught. I think so. And it's mysterious and it's actually a good thing to have mystery. Not that we shouldn't always be contemplating the mystery. Every question we answer is always going to bring up multiple new questions. And that's part of how growth works. It's similar to when you see a branch on a tree split off into two new branches. That's like a question is answered. <laughs> a quest is finished. And now you have multiple new directions to go. And we expand in multiple directions at once. That's why any authentic journey that someone's on that's like an awakening journey constitutes both the recognition of everything getting better all the time and also everything getting worse somehow at the same time. <laughs> it's just expansion. That's like the nature of it. But there's always a cleanup process. There's always, you know, whenever something hits rock bottom, like a dead carcass, the only way yeah. to go from there is back to the top, back to cleanliness, back to emptiness which is, it's a Taoist concept that actually the emptiness is the, is what gives anything its value. And so that's also something to not, to, to keep in mind and not be super frightened by all the doom and gloom that they push on us in terms of climate. I realized that there are horrible things going on to the environment, things that are not the ones that make the news headlines, 
what's getting dumped in the waterways, for example, stuff like that. But we also could re really be hopeful that if nature was emptied to a degree, then the only thing that could happen next would be a bounce back. And I don't believe that the creation is able to just be wiped out by <laughs> measly little humans in a way that's irrevocable. That's what all these movies about the post-apocalypse and the nuclear fallout and so many video games on this subject, they're all there to give you the belief that that's the direction humanity is going and to further the feeling of hopelessness. And that feeling is a dangerous one because as soon as you're feeling hopeless, now you have an excuse for not trying. But back to the stealth topic Can I say again. Something quickly about that. Oh, please do. And just to remind anybody who's come on the, the call new, this is Chance Garten. His website is innerverse.com. He has a great Telegram channel, and uh, I'm super happy to have him here for the third or fourth time. I can't remember. And um, <clears throat> darn it, I lost what I was going to say. It's so hard to know too. because you've been on mine a few times. I've been on yours, and, and then you've I'm covered some really cool ground. Room. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so... Darn it. Okay, I'll have to let it go. It'll Maybe it'll come back. It will. As soon as you decide it's not important enough to worry about, then it's just like, here I am. <laughs> exactly. So I'll interrupt you again, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Yeah. And I really have more curiosity about your insight on the concept because you work that I'm about to get into because you work with people on an entrepreneurial mentorship type basis. And so I want to talk about the concept of stealth in terms of delivering a project or bringing something to market metaphorically. And that is, uh, <laughs> I think something I've struggled with in my life when something cool is on the horizon, when a big opportunity comes, the first thing I want to do is tell all my favorite people about it. But I've realized, and that doesn't mean I still don't do it sometimes and still shoot myself in the foot, but I've realized when I do that, there's this weird tendency for whatever it was to end up not panning out in some way, or if it's something that I'm required to do for it to happen, especially it won't, I won't get it done. And I think what's going on here is like eating your meal before it's finished being prepared. In a sense, you are, you're looking for that energetic hit, that dopamine hit of how exciting it is to tell somebody something that pumps you up and makes you feel like, feel like that you've accomplished something that you are accomplished. But the reality is, and at least in the situation I'm describing, is you didn't actually accomplish it yet. <laughs> it's an ethereal idea still. It could go either way, even if it seems like a sure thing. And by going around and seeking that energy from others, which is even, it's not even a fully healthy thing to do that in general. Uh, not that we can't be excited about ourselves or proud about our, our accomplishments, but it's just about the right timing of it. And when we have consumed that energy before it's actually finished gestating, it's kind of like a premature baby. I mean, that's a really apt, similar metaphor. You don't want to deliver the baby before it's actually finished. Although a mother has every right to be excited and tell everyone about it. That's not really a stealth thing. <laughs> it's obvious when you're pregnant. Yeah. Anyway, I think that you are robbing yourself of, a, you're sort of self vampirizing when you do this because you're taking the energy that needs to be earned later and trying to access it now. And then you don't have the throughput later to actually follow it through because you've already sort of stolen that. And the anticipation, I think it's about shifting what is exciting about it from recognition to anticipation and fulfillment of uh, a, a goal or a duty. And so you can still be thrilled when the opportunity comes or when you have this idea for an awesome project that you want to manifest, but instead of going to the wrong people, and here's the other thing about it. I say the wrong people. The reason I say the wrong people is because everyone has an effect on your energetic field. And if you tell somebody something that you want to do and they don't understand it the same way you do, or they don't see it as a positive the way you do, or any number of conflicting perspectives that actually infects can infect your own perspective on it, even on a subconscious level, and be part of what eventually drives you to not complete, or it takes away your drive to complete, whatever the case may be. And there's so much to do with 
our personal energy, like our biofield health, our, our chakra health for a simpler way of putting it, that determines whether or not we have the throughput to finish what we start. And that is a big deal to work on your own energy system to practice finishing things. Like if you have nine out of 10 dishes done, don't walk away yet. <laughs> finish the 10th one. Give yourself as many of those little wins. And this comes back to the taming power of the small of completing something that you started when you started it. And it's so easy to not do that in today's time where something can pull you away at any moment. And it's usually a technological pull away. <laughs> mm -hmm. But in general, if we can practice finishing what we started, that will give us more of, or at the very least, we'll reveal why it's difficult to finish what we start if we are struggling to do so. Or it will give us the practice we need to do that in a, the bigger picture items. But I want to know your thoughts on this whole dynamic of eating the meal before it's cooked, if you will. Yeah, I have a I have a bunch of answers to that. And I'm pretty sure it's just going to deepen the mystery. But there are a few guidelines. So it's like you said that if you're going out there and you're telling people about your plans in order to gain their approval, because you're insecure, you don't have a, a foundation strong enough inside yourself to just run with it and go. So you need to go out and everybody go like, Oh, my gosh, you're amazing. Wow, that's so good. You're doing that. And and then you also risk the person that says, oh, you can't do that. That's very classic in some people's lives where they've, they've, they've always got some, oh, you never finished anything before. Why are you going to do that? You know, literally trying to take you down and out. So you do risk that. And it's better not to risk it because then you have to contend with whatever it is they brought up in you. Um, but, you know, having said that, for example, with my book, I talked up a storm about that book before it was published. And one of the reasons I did that uh, was so that I, I was fully committed. It wasn't just a promise that I said, I'm going to do this. Like I told, I told my coach and I hired a coach and I, I hired several coaches and I hired editors and, you know, so I had the to right get, people, I had to get the right people, but I went actually to my public and I began to sell the book. I sold nearly a hundred copies of my book before it was published. Right. So it was an act for me of, um, throwing my hat over the fence and I had to, I had to, I had to do it. There were many times where it looked impossible, many days. And I often remember that in my impossible days now to see, to, to prove to myself, like, yeah, you thought that was impossible and you think this is impossible and you got to the other side. So it's, it's a level of accountability that I said, I'm doing this and I'm bloody well going to do it. I don't care what it takes. I'm going to do whatever it takes. So that's always worked really well for me. I hear at the same time about consuming your food because, uh, and people do this with accomplishments of the past. They are always out there telling you what they did that was so great. It doesn't matter if it was two years ago or five years ago or a hundred years ago or whatever. No one really lives past a hundred. Uh, and, and they're living off of a kind of pride that's not healthy. There, there is healthy pride where you're just simply proud of yourself and you're, you're full of energy because of it. You don't need anything from anyone, whether you get their endorsement or not, but where, where it's coming from that place of, of shadow pride where your accomplishments are all in the past and you're not, actually stretching and working to grow and create something in the present so you rest on your laurels and you, and you get everybody's approval and you puff up and you feel good about that and you play the same video over and over and over again look what I did look what I did and, uh, and but you're not in that real-time cookery of, of uh, putting yourself to the test and, and going to your next level of epitome. We have a, uh, Benjamin Balderson apparently is, is here today. So I, I, I use that often now, just we're always reaching for our epitome, the, the, pure, the pure expression of who we are with no garbage in between. So it can work both ways, but I think the motive is everything, right? What, where, you, where you're coming from, are, are, you, are you actually trying to give something um, to help? I, I don't know what you would give uh, you know, to inspiration, sometimes it can have the opposite effect. People will actually get jealous and hate you. <laughs> and, and even if they say right words about what you're doing, they may actually be energetically wishing you not well. And I think we've all been in that place where you see somebody doing something great and it makes you feel bad about yourself. You know, so it's pretty yeah. easy. See, now this is cool, what you just said there, because this is another element of stealth, if you will, that I 
picked up by skimming through the animal medicine tarot that I've got. And so, first of all, before I get to that, I just want to say I think it's brilliant that you brought up how com coming out in the open with creating your book had a positive effect to help you kick in the afterburners and make sure that you finished it and made it perf as perfect as possible. And I know you even continued to work on it after the first release, and it's been very much improved even since then. I know because I've read the book and it's fantastic <laughs> and I'm looking forward to anything you write in the future. But see, the difference there is you did form a strong, strong commitment in many ways to the outcome. And and that's not exactly the same as like just shooting off your mouth to random people at the bar or something that I'm going to write a book. You know, I've seen a lot of people try to make friends off of telling other people what they're working on, but that has never been finished just as a way of like, I, this is something I do. And it's cool to have hobbies. And this isn't like, I don't know, judgmental. This is something we all do. I'm just pointing out a key difference, which is something you were also pointing out the intent behind the sharing being in one case, like I want to get pumped up right now versus in your case, I want to make sure this actually happens. And I want to involve all the right people with the process and make sure that it has a healthy delivery because by getting people to pre-order the book, not only does that give you a strong commitment to finish, it also gives you some support at the finish line to help you move through that goal. So all in all, in all that's brilliant. And part of the investment that you made and commitment you made is working with coaches. That's also a really great way to, and that can still be something that's stealthy too. You can do, you can work with coaches without the whole world needing to know what it is that you're cooking up. But anyway, yeah, what you said about all the time, people, people uh, will never admit to having the coach in their background, which is fine. And in fact, when we worked in, in marketing and PR, it was the same thing. We worked on behalf of the big clients. We were always behind the scenes. We, we, we were not getting the glory, but that was the whole point. They, they came to us so they, they would get more glory. <laughs> so the other thing involved here that uh, you brought up was how sometimes we can feel bad when we see other people doing big things or doing good things. And that's kind of our problem, first of all. But there is a type of achiever that without necessarily meaning to can kind of rub it in other people's face, what they've achieved and that others haven't, especially though those ones that are resting on their laurels, as you said, of past achievements. But there's more than that. I myself have had a lot of conflict with my family, for example, when I see we're at a gathering like the 4th of July that just happened, although I didn't get into conflict about this on the 4th of July. I think I've learned how to communicate more healthily about it, but I'll see what they're eating. Right. And I'll be like, you know, that's this or that. And it has this in it. And that does that. And, you know, I'm just questioning them about these things. And in a way, it's not that it's my intention, but it makes them feel like I'm just pointing out how much better than them I am. And that's the reaction they have. And again, that's their perspective that's flavoring that reaction because it never was my intention. But it makes you think like if you, I want to have a positive influence on them, then I am going to have to change the way that I address what the thing is that I'm seeing. And this comes to what I wanted to bring up from the animal medicine deck, which is the fox card. And foxes are so cool. They are the camouflage uh, card in this deck. Mm. And so I think this is just sort of like a generalization and a universalization of many different native tribes and traditions of North and South America. So this isn't like, if there is such a thing, official Native American correlations or something. But this is just out of this book. Um, it's a super old book. Medicine Cards is what it's called. Oh, hey, and blow that up for us. Yeah. Or even this one. I found an one old second. used copy of this book in mm. an occult bookstore in my town mm. years ago. But I'm sure you can get new copies of it still. But I was looking for a deck and I was like, what do you have that's not on display? And they pulled that out and it was in a Ziploc bag. It didn't even have like the original box. And for some reason, I had never heard of this deck, but I thought that is something I need. And it is really an awesome set of oracle cards that can apply to a lot of situations and super fun you could use it to find your personal totem 
power animals. And that's a cool thing the book can guide you through. But Fox being camouflaged, why this is important. First of all, it's a quality of stealthiness to be adaptable and cunning. And that's a Fox thing for sure. And the benefit of operating from stealth in terms of when you're coming up with a new project is if you've told everyone, this is what I'm doing, it's going to be just like this. And then you get halfway through the process and you're like, I can't actually do that. I need to change what's going to be done here. Adaptability is easier from stealth because nobody's going to be confused or concerned with why this is different than what was originally said. A coach is different. A coach would be like, okay, let's adapt. And they would work with you on that. Mm -hmm. But foxes also have uh, some, some foxes can change the color of their coat with the season, which I think is really cool. And that's something that we could all learn from as a quality to, and this applies to the situation of how you communicate with loved ones about things that are difficult. But specifically, the fox, one of the qualities of fox in this book is that it watches over the family undetected so that it doesn't make others feel bad about what is observed. So this doesn't mean you like hide from your family members. It just means that when you do see something that concerns you and your family members behavior, you don't make them feel the energy of you think that they're screwing up, you know, and that is a tricky skill to learn because especially those of us that are quite in tune with our emotions and energetically flowing, our natural tendency is to just like let whatever it is expressed right then and there, however it wants to come out. And that's not unhealthy. It's just a question of what result are you going to get with family members with that type of behavior or with loved ones. Mm -hmm. So the fox has this magic of being able to adapt to the season. And by that, in this context, you could say you are hiding, you're observing, you're observing from camouflage. You might not be, I don't know, just don't make it as obvious that you're super paying attention to what they're doing. But then at the right moment, when the right thing could be suggested or said in the right way that you've, that you intuitively or your heart has helped you find the words for that aren't going to be abrasive or make them feel cut down, then you can deliver that in a cunning way, <laughs> in a camouflaged way. Or you might even just come up with a solution for them that they don't necessarily even need to get. Like, you're worried about them eating dairy, so you bring a uh, non-dairy mac and cheese to the family potluck and sneak it on their plate, <laughs> something like that, you know? And you're not saving them from their own choices, but afterwards you can be like, hey, did you know that was non-dairy and you could, you liked it? So I'll give you this recipe. That's, <laughs> these are just examples that are coming into my head that would be probably more effective than being like, you're an idiot for eating dairy, you know, it's basically poison. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, I've done that with my kid a lot that, uh, you know, I put the raw egg in the smoothie. And then I'll say, did you know a raw egg is actually more nutritious than a, a cooked one? And he's like, ew. And it's like, did you know it was in your smoothie? And they make eggnog the same way. And you just enjoyed it, right? So, you know, it's a little bit of a trickery there. Uh, but I do have lots to say about the, the you know, in, and, and maybe no conclusion here either. So hold open for it. But there's a phrase and I can't find it. I was just trying to trying to search it. It's something like mind hacking. It's some kind of hacking. And it's an author out there. I'd really have to go back in, in my uh, my archives and see who I was reading at the time. But his his pro, uh, plan for writing a book is to put the content out first. And you test it on the public. If you have an audience already, you you know maybe put a an article out at a time, a portion, a chapter, or part of a part of a chapter out at a time, and you watch your metrics. You see how was it received? What do, what do people um, gravitate towards in terms of the the body of content? What what makes them more excited? What are they more passionate about? And then by the time you're putting that book together, you're probably going to draw what engaged your audience more if you're coming from a marketing perspective, right? And then if, if it's purely sold, then you're not going to um, reference your public or make them let them decide what goes forward and, and what stays in behind. And, and there's incredible um, success from it, because not only are you finding out what works, but you have created a very powerful bond with your audience by allowing them to grow with you in the process. They know you're not done. They know your intentions. They see it's kind of raw. 
uh, I do this with courses. So I just ran a group business training that I'd only ever done for 15 years one on one. And so I gave this first group uh, savings, a, a big savings, like, you know, 33% to be involved with me in the process to give me feedback and uh, to tell me what's working, what's not working, all of that kind of thing. So they're fully in the know about it. They understand that I'm not new to this. I've done this, you know, hundreds of times with people, but I've never run it as a group. So I want to see how is this going to work and how can you make use of it? And uh, it's very satisfying because now that I'm starting to finish this first group, I'm way more prepared for the next one. They're going to benefit. I will, I will benefit because I can charge the full investment. And uh, so, and, and is, it, is it embarrassing? Sure, you know, I got, yesterday I got uh, nine voicemails in a row from one of them. Uh, I asked for feedback and oh, she gave it. Bring. I still haven't had the, you know, the hour or so to listen to all of that. And it's gonna be, it's gonna be painful, I know it, because it's gonna tell me things that I uh, don't consider to be mistakes. And like right away, I'm already defensive in my head going like, because it was over a glossary. It's like, well, these are my definitions, but I didn't express that yet. These are my definitions. This is how I've been taught. This is how I teach. If you go to your Webster's and your Black's Law and whatever, and all those dictionaries, they're going to say something different anyway. And here's how I'm teaching it. So that makes me clean up my act a little bit and make sure that I express. And this is the key point. So and one more example is that I was on my soapbox for a lot of years. And you can go back in my YouTubes and see, although I wasn't as nearly uh, public with my message in that way on YouTube, but I was saying women should take over the world and men were responsible for all the problems. It was this, this podcast was born because I had an awakening and, and decided to express it. How could I keep that to myself? Now I know that for God's sake, I have to come clean. So I came out and I told my audience that I was wrong. And it's a, it's a risk because all of the women in my world, or not all of them, but a lot of them just went like, oh, Beth lost it. She's not, she's not, uh, you know, spreading my beautiful narrative anymore. And uh, I'll just say, oh, I thought you were so spiritual. I thought you were so together, all this kind of thing. And I risked losing them. I was just looking at my, un my unsubscribe numbers and it's like, oh, a, a thousand went off the, the rails around that time, right? A thousand out of, and it's, you know, that, that's substantial. So you have to risk losing people to grow. And, and, but, but I noticed that the people who've stayed with me over the years, they've become a fan of watching me grow. It's part of the entertainment or it's part of, in fact, what draws them in to seeing that growth capacity inside themselves. I have to eat humble pie, but at the same time, I don't ever have to camouflage. But I think there is, uh, there, there still are bona fide times to do that. Yeah, uh, the camouflage thing it, there's an advantage to stealth in the sense of, I guess where I'm going with this, let me back up. I know that it's not only once that you had to experience a drop off in people that followed you, but actually it happened again, if I'm not mistaken, when all of the pandemic stuff started to hit the fan and you had to make the choice like many people, myself included, to no longer play to the middle <laughs> about certain things and just be blunt about the reality of what's going on to not be harsh. But if people can't handle that, they're not really aligned with the message that you're putting out in other territories, right? So it's really important in terms of getting the right people in your life to be authentic and not camouflage who you truly are. And that can be a downside of camouflage. It can be uh, people pleasing can be a part of it. In fact, that's the persona. It exists just for the sake that you sometimes need to act differently around one guy than you do around this other girl. And there are a lot of reasons why you might develop these personality, these alternate personalities. And man, this is a tangent, but I've recently read a book that you've just got to read. It is called Soul Centered Healing, I believe, by Dr. Tom Zinser or Zisner. Can't remember which, right? But he's a psychologist. He used hypnotherapy and he's studying people with multiple personality disorder. Mm. And what he found out was that actually everybody's got several ego states, is what they're called, which is literally an in the psychic realm, an individuated, separated 
and uh, authentically its own consciousness that is within us. And then these ego states can usually they just influence us, but sometimes they even hop over and take control in terms of extreme trauma. And that's where alter personalities and MK ultra research all was developed. But finally, there are people that have been studying this in a context of healing and found out that, yeah, we all carry around these other selves and until they're properly integrated with the conscious self, they can be saboteur archetypes of a bunch of different flavors. Uh, all the basically all the archetypes could exist as an unintegrated ego state. So I'd find that really interesting. But yeah, we've had to come out of into the open with what we think about things, but that also gives us the benefit of being seen by the people that resonate with us properly. And that's mm -hmm. very powerful. But camouflage still has its place because while it is important that we come out in the open on our channels and say what needs to be said and don't hide from the YouTube bully algorithm, uh, there's still a line that would be unwise to cross in terms of painting a target on yourself for any reason. And that usually comes in the form of just being, usually that would only even occur if you're crossing other lines morally being too aggressive or too combative or even you know seeking to go out and hurt people or go into someone's actual house who you think is a part of the problem and all of the type of shaming that we see coming from mostly the left to us uh, unwashed unvaccinated unmasked people <laughs> it's the same type of thing if we use those type of tactics on them back it would be harmful to us in a lot of ways and it would also allow the system if you will to have a reason to bring us down sometimes. So the other aspect of weasel stealth in the Native American mythology, at least that I'm referring to from this book, is that it has the ability to spy on the enemy. And that's pretty cool. Uh, we actually can do that with our research and the type of conversations we have on our podcast. It's very much like spying on the enemy we're going to people who have been the weasel, if you will, and not in the negative sense that it is held up to in most Western cultural ideas, but in this positive sense of stealth, we are using this weasel magic to see and hear what's really going on. That's part of the weasel's power. They thought that some tribes thought that if you wore a weasel pelt that had like the ears still attached and everything, that the weasel magic would or the weasel spirit would allow you to see the hidden reasons for things or hear what's not being said when things are said and that's very much what we are about in this type of role is finding the people that went in and found out what was really being said underneath all the the um, propaganda context and they bring that back to us and we gain wisdom from it and it allows us to be adaptable and be cunning and know what moves are coming down the pike i mean we all predicted a year ago what would be going on right now <laughs> and here we are so that's mm -hmm. that is all weasel medicine but it's not even just something that applies to the negative and the the evil powers that we are combating i guess or trying to just survive in some sense <laughs> it's also about the fact that god or great spirit or the universe whatever you want to call the intelligent creative force of all things speaks to us at all times with things that are hidden in plain sight magical miraculous synchronistic synchromistic co beyond coincidence things that reflect our inner and outer worlds like a mirror perfectly and we can in our subjective uh, inner world we can know that that was something that was a cosmic wink that was a, <laughs> a little practical joke from the divine that things lined up just like that. And that's part of this weasel magic to see what's really there, to be able to also view, have a, a wider view of synchronicity in the world. And that comes from operating in the dark, not in a negative or a sneaking around sense, but in that we're not afraid to go into the unknown places or look past the surface level of things. And it's not just, nothing is meaningless whenever you have this particular weasel medicine 
you can see the connections and things in a way that other people can't. And that is one of our greatest powers in this time. And I think is one of the reasons why, if you can call it a truth movement, <laughs> the, those of us that have been doing this are having any level of success. It's because we're showing connections and helping people see that connections like this exist. And then that comes into their own personal life, whether or not they're a content creator. And it's empowering to know that nothing happens for without reason behind it, without purpose. And mm -hmm. this is a, a big take home message of, of stealth is it's about seeing what's hidden in plain sight as well. What is, because I think that that's how you, the universe or the great spirit definitely operates to just put things in plain sight for us to catch. If we're paying attention, it's like testing our spiritual awareness. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. There's so much there in what you we talked about. Uh, I'm taking notes as you can hear. Um, so the hiding thing, this is one of the things that I teach and especially when it comes to the business coaching, because, uh, the majority of women, it's not as prevalent with men. They have a thing about, and, uh, the Naikas, uh, you, you made this comment about, you know, that they're afraid to be seen and no doubt it's some kind of ancestral memory that being seen meant you were going to go under, you were being seen for who you are who you are is considered to be not acceptable socially. And so you get pushed out, um, you know, ostracized. And, and there were times where we would die of that. So that's one, that's one possible reason for that. And, uh, and then so they use the power of what I would call the alchemist, that which has no power, it's your power, to instead of uh, work magic, is to use that power to hide oneself. Right. So it's a major conflict of interest when you're building a business. It's you can't hide it. Uh, I mean, you can hide while you're building and then, like you said, come out with it. But more often than not, that has what I see to be there is a shadow of uh, another archetype called the lover who needs to get everything perfect before anybody sees it. So there's no room for criticism, no, no way to, to get in. But it comes down to that same like using your superpower to hide. And then you're screwed. You're, you've got inner conflict. You're consuming all of your energy internally. You know, better to release that fear of being seen and then see what to do. It doesn't mean that you have to get out there and you have to do this business or you have to be seen on, on a video or do a podcast or, you know, lots of shy people find ways to be seen and get a message out. But to resolve that inner, that inner um, desire to hide yourself because your people will never find you. That's the most important part. It's, it's not even just in a business context, but if your people can't see you, they can't find you, there's no way to build community with them. And that's, to me, a huge part of purpose, if not even identical with purpose, is our connection with our people. Uh, so that's, that's a big one. Also, you know, um, I've been told I have x-ray vision to, to be able to see in and see through. It's not to intimidate people, but... Uh, I see a lot and I'd have no, I have no uh, evidence or fact for seeing what I see. And quite often I spent years of my life checking what I see to, to find out, you know, what's my own inner stuff and what's this vision. Uh, and we have, we have a society full of people who, who don't want to be seen. They're terrified. Even the best people don't want to be seen. They're biting their tongue and they're, editing themselves and and you know negotiating is this is this going to be useful to them are they just going to hate me is there, do I need to maintain some relationships so they can still access me when they grow up and all of that negotiations is a is a huge waste of energy I'll just say it point blank this is my opinion if you take the risk of coming out sooner than later and being your authentic self then everything will sort itself out if they're going to hate you sooner or later, make it sooner because you're, you're wasting your time. They already hate you. It just hasn't been expressed because you haven't come forward. And, you know, there's no bigger gift than being surrounded by people who, who get you, who like you, who know you. Um, and it, you don't need that. It be, so it becomes a, a really fertile ground for all kinds of uh, breakthroughs to happen on, on mutual uh, levels, right? Um, and here's, a, here's another aspect of something that is very true, what you said, and Randy Kelton, who's the host of Rule of Law Radio, we're going to have him on the Law Summit. Uh, he's, he's like, and I don't remember his exact words, I know there's maxims around this, never tell your enemy what you're going to do to them. 
element of surprise. Don't go like, hey, you know, and then and then there's another whole flip side to it is that you, um, to settle with your brother on the way to court so that you can potentially not have to go into that higher level fight. You can, you can settle. Well, how do you settle with your brother out of court? You have to tell them what you're, you plan to do, right? So the, the very opposing directions. And sometimes until you see them uh, in, in the same situation next to each other, they both sound true. Uh, like that there's a maxim of law that says ignorance of the law is no excuse. But then the other side of it is intent is everything, right? So uh, we just had Alphonse Fagiolo completely blow out of the water all of the birth certificates, uh, Mysteria that's going around now. I'm calling it Mysteria. Uh, you know, I don't know. I use that word a lot now, thanks to you. <laughs> oh, man, that word is so useful. <laughs> oh, best ever. Can you tell people, by the way, the um, when you, you interviewed Michael Tessarian, the, the name to look for in your podcasts? Because that was brilliant. Life changer. Oh, sure. That episode with Michael is actually the one that I have as the channel trailer, I think. So it should be viewable from the main page of my YouTube channel at interversepodcast.com. Or you could go to my website and just type in Tessarion in the search bar. And we had an entire conversation about that word Mysteria, which is, to put it simply, it is being lost in ideas about other people's ideas and how we often live in a word and the word becomes our reality and we're no longer connected to a capital R actual reality. So with law, that's a perfect place to point out all the different, I guess, cul-de-sacs before the gold mine that you could get on. Things that are fascinating and have deep esoteric significance, but in terms of what's gonna happen when you go into their court, it's not going to really work out for you because the rank and file peons don't have a clue about the esoteric aspects of the law. And uh, they also don't even have much of a clue about how their own system works. So it makes more sense to just get the simplest, easiest solution and remedy possible without needing to get into things that may or may not work or may or may not be understood. I think with law, it's about what works and make that happen. And I do think that it's one of the most suppressed information types out there. I, I can't tell you how many times I've met some old dude somewhere and started talking to them about law. And they start telling me all this stuff that they've known since like the 80s or 90s about law that are things that we talk about now. But they'll tell me things like, yeah, when I was researching this stuff, I had agents in suits coming to my house and interrogating me. Because before the internet age, a lot of this information was a lot more strictly repressed because I think it was known that if it gets out of the bag in too big of a way, they're going to have a real problem on their hands. And that could be why there's a great reset going on because we know their tricks and enough of us do and are sharing that, that it could very well throw too many wrenches in the gears and I think already has in terms of what they've been able to achieve with all of these draconian tyrannical measures that have been put out for the pandemic. So that is a definite advantage of stealth in terms of law to be able to communicate with your groups through private Zoom channels and have private summits and don't necessarily give out every remedy to the whole public where then a plant or an agent could find that out and be like, where, where do we patch up the defenses? But I think there's not too much to worry about there. The legal system is what it is. And when it comes to the basics of just knowing how to give your authorized statement to the court in the form of an affidavit, those simple tricks are really what they are more interested in repressing. And that's why so much uh, stuff that just gets people spinning their wheels is put out into the dialogue. Because if we just did the stuff that people like Alphonse talked about, it may not be flashy, it may not be complicated, but the facts are the facts. And, you know, it's very simple. Was there harm, loss, or damage incurred? Yes or no? Does this individual charging me have personal knowledge of this uh, event? Yes or no? Was there ever a con uh, like an, a proper contract reached? Yes or no? Very basic stuff, but those are often the most effective things in the toolkit, right? And 
so we think I think that we should be careful about what we attempt to share with the law information, I guess. And there's a just like you said, with the idea of settling with your brother before you get to court or taking it into the court. These are two powers we have, like the yes and the no, the masculine and the feminine. And we need to be very wise and choosy about when, when we choose one or the other and not ever be on autopilot with it or acting just out of our emotional trauma or our desire to get back at somebody. The, our intentions, the more pure our intentions can be for anything that we're undertaking, the better it's going to go. And, you know, another side of stealth to pivot away from this topic in a little bit and go back to the original topic and uh, maybe transition into talking about the concept of grace soon as well. There's a definite saboteur element that lives in the stealth, which is how easy it's become for many people in our world to be functional addicts of some kind of something, usually multiple things. I think the interesting aspect of addiction is that it's usually like five addictions or none. <laughs> They're all coming from a similar place, a similar mentality. But I think that those of us that have been disconnected from our, from spirit, if you will, it's really easy to convince somebody that what they're doing that nobody else sees doesn't affect anybody else. And so I think we can only really contemplate this about our own lives, but what do we do when we think no one's looking? And is that different than what we would do if people were looking? And that's a difficult lesson to learn because it's so easy to think that you may act without the same amount of consequences if nobody sees you do it, but it's not true. First of all, <laughs> you see, you know, you see what you did and in the same respect, God sees. So there's never any hiding, but also in the field, in your, the, the field around you, there's going to be an energetic imprint of every thought, behavior, and action that is a part of your personal energy. And that's going to hook in more deeply to people that you're close with. And it's a, one of the greatest lessons of life to realize that the best way to help other people get better is for you to get better. And this is a grace thing. <laughs> grace is radiating a sense of well-being and, and oneness with yourself and the world. And the funny thing about the word alone in terms of doing things that you think no one sees because you're alone, alone is phonetically all one. So anytime you think you're alone, even if it's because you're feeling lonely, remember that actually you're feeling your oneness. That's all oneness, not aloneness. And so you are only experiencing yourself and no other beings right now because you're quote unquote alone, which is exactly the same way it would feel if you were in touch with everything at once and you were all one with everything, then you would be the only being. And that's a connection to God right there is realizing this fact that you're, when you are alone, that's when the all one is present within you. And therefore you're not hiding anything from anybody at any time. And it's just a matter of understanding that dynamic to help you lift. This helped me a lot personally in earlier times of my life to realize, yeah, I'm not getting away with this or that. There's nothing to get away with. There's nowhere to go away with. <laughs> How do you take anything from that which is already everything? Mm -hmm. It doesn't work. And it's a very helpful perspective on to help with loneliness and also to help with um, being authentic. That is being authentic is not being different with one in one situation to another other than adaptability. But that's a different question. It's about who you are. Mm -hmm. And yeah, a lot of times we meet our heroes and they're not <laughs> who they seemed like whenever you catch them off the screen. And I personally avoid idolizing people like heroes until they're my personal friend and I know what they're really like. And then I admire them as a hero, but because of who I know that they are instead of a persona, what may be a persona. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Exactly. Beautiful points. And, you know, that th hiding is the highest crime. And this is something I know I, I came here to learn this for myself, of course, right? Because if I'm hiding from other people, 
And then, and it's usually because you did something wrong. That's what you're hiding, right? That's the, that's the main thing. There can be all the other reasons that we're talking about too. You know, your baby's being born and it's very fragile and all that kind of thing. So, so knowing that we already talked about that, but to- I've actually also seen people not want people to see how good they are because they don't oh, want precisely. anyone to come to them. That's the thing. Exactly. Exactly. And we're way more afraid of being seen for how great we are than being seen as a failure, right? Success is a much greater fear than, than uh, failure. Uh, and, and so you, it is the greatest harm. It's why the Bible harps on it, right? Like the, 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 the hiding and the deceit and the lies and all that kind of thing that always come to the surface. In fact, they come to the surface immediately because there's an energetic effect of it when you lie to someone. So I've had, I've had a liar in my life. It's, it's my lesson to learn, uh, you know, to, to uh, not be naive and to, to understand that betrayal is happening, not to try to prevent betrayal. It's like, no, this is going on and there's a contract and there's a certain, you know, a locked nature to the contract for the time being. Uh, and when something, I, I, it's made me develop such fine, spidey senses. I can tell before I, 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 you know, I'll have dreams, I'll have a sense, there'll be something happening to me. And, and I know, I know there's something going on by my, behind my back. I just know it. And I've been right every freaking time. Uh, it comes out sooner or later, right? But that, that mentality that, that, well, if I just, if I just hide it, and it's extremely prevalent. That, you know, just tell them I need to know basis or, or um, I don't want them thinking this of me or that, or uh, maybe I can just slip through, get away with it. Like, you know, I, and I just want to tell you all kinds of stories right now, which I won't. I'm going to go into stealth because it's, it's a complicated situation that, that won't benefit from everybody's consciousness being, being on it and being in it. But I know the injury. It's huge. So, so whether you're lying to yourself, you're lying to other people, probably both. You'll have mixed motives why you're doing it. But at the end of the day, just simply, because it's like you said, you can't get away from it. The witness is always there. The witness is always there. And I don't know if this is true about the body but, or the, the, the Bible and you know, the whole judgment and everything. It's possible the judgment is here right now. It's not coming. It's, it, you know, and, and babies know right from wrong. We interviewed Dolores Cahill the other day. She said it. It is, it, is, it is inside of us. We have moral ground unless it's destroyed and concealed and, and your, your being is evacuated and you can't get in touch with all of those feelings. But, you know, you do wrong to a baby, they know it and they're going to tell you. And then, you know, you, you grow to a certain age and you, and you start knowing. I, I had a big talk with my son about it. Like when you do something wrong, it gives you a lot of pain until you right that wrong until you just simply come clean. And that's, that's again what the Bible says, that all can be forgiven. You just have to ask for forgiveness. You have to humble yourself and go, okay, I went wrong. And either I intended to go wrong or I didn't intend to go wrong, but I, I caused harm. And now I'm going to come clean and I'm going to do whatever it takes to remedy that. That's, that's people who live and die in honor. And I think that's like the ultimate calling of, of where we're at. And then back to grace, right? What, what is, what is, you can't, you can't go chasing grace. That's not going to work. You try to chase any experience because to me, the thing that we want, it's already here. We already have this, right? You can't go looking for grace or trying to enact grace or make it that, make that happen. You, then, then you're actually telling creator that you don't have that, you need that. And guess what it's going to give, what the creator is going to present you with is a whole bunch of circumstances that aren't graceful. So you will find grace in, in the lack of grace. You'll, you'll, you'll see what's really there eventually when you're broken down enough to, to surrender to reality, <laughs> right? I love it. Yeah, I think what you said, we can't go looking for grace. I agree with that because we can't, there's nowhere to go to look for it. It's already all around. So to me, grace is about maintaining an awareness of the beauty and things at all times. And then that's going to uplift your perspective at all times. And as you said, if there are things that are not working out in your field, in your behavior, in your surroundings, in your relationships, you're going to be, because you're looking for 
not looking for, but you're maintaining a constant awareness of beauty around you, you'll notice when something is disharmonious with everything else. And it will be obvious that that's what needs to change. So that's the, uh, the magic of even the shadow archetype is that it reveals to you where the problem lies. <laughs> and the problem is usually involving lies or self-deception. Exactly. Yeah, denial. I, I think every archetype will have it have its own version of, of lying, right? With the child, it's just straight, I'm going to pull the cover over my head and pretend this isn't happening, wait till it's over. Uh, you know, how, how does an alchemist hide much more in the stealth category? That's a, That would be an alchemist word to me, although I bet there's other archetypes who would fit in. How does the lover hide out of that perfectionism? It's not, it's not right yet. And it's not beautiful yet, right? Like that's, that's totally a lover script to be, to look at looking for, for the beauty, uh, even in ugly things. Um, you know, if we pull out the warrior, what would the warrior be? It would be all about strategy. Hiding would be like, don't tell the enemy where you're going to attack because then it won't work. They'll know what you're doing. They'll, they'll preemptively strike or, or do something to block you. Um, yeah, uh, another fun anecdote regarding similar idea there would be about dragonfly, which is a in the Native American medicine deck here. It's about illusion. But when you talk about not telling the enemy what you're going to do to them, another way of saying that is don't show your hand in a game of cards or don't show off unnecessarily. So there's this old story about dragonfly which used to be actually a dragon and why there are no dragons left in the world is because coyote came up to dragonfly one day and coyote's the trickster which is there to help us ultimately <laughs> to reveal it's the saboteur showing to reveal where the weakness is right coyote comes up to dragon and says oh you're so powerful you i bet you could do anything right and dragon's like of course i'll do whatever you want to see i can do it all i'm basically omnipotent and coyote's like well could you turn yourself into a really tiny creature that was basically powerless and dragon's like yeah watch i got this no problem transforms into a dragonfly and then coyote laughs and says now you are a pathetic weak dragonfly with <laughs> no godly powers anymore and that's how dragon became dragonfly that's sort of the the take there and the idea was that you know, you don't need to show off your power uh, unnecessarily. There's danger in doing that. You could get tricked, basically. You could trick yourself into self-harm in a way. And it's just like simple as not spending energy that you don't need to spend and being conservative about your choices in life because it's a fact that whatever you do choose, you also unchoose other things because there's only so much available energy and time in a given day like that always replenishes there's always the next day but in the, a given day you can't do it all so why waste your time doing things that you know you can do that serve no purpose just to gain <laughs> gain the uh, recognition from others and i think that's a, a great lesson dragonfly's whole thing is about illusion i guess in the native american deck and about figuring out all the ways that we are deceiving ourselves in a way, uh, one way or another. So that also applies to what we've been discussing here. And then I wanted to tell that story about dragonfly because then there's a, the card that represents grace in the native deck is the swan. And I'll tell that story after I kick it back to you or when we get there. Okay, perfect. Yeah, I love that about the dragonfly. It's so good. Those things don't give you facts. They give you awakening. Right, because I can't draw any real conclusions from it, but there was like some kind of light went on, so I love that. Thank you. And uh, and then just to to your point about showing power, you only have to show power when you don't have it, or when you are hiding it from yourself, when you believe it's not there, right? When you have true power and true authority, it speaks for itself. You don't need to bang people over the head with it. They see it. They will be drawn by it. It's a natural kind of a magnetic force. And that's, that's the good versus evil, right? The, the, the evil forces are trying to dominate because they don't see we've been given dominion. They need to control and take ownership and, and destroy out of this vacuum of power. They don't have power. They don't have anything. 
In fact, they're running scared. They're terrified of, of what we already know to be true. So, you know, I don't know exactly where I'm going, but, you know, power and grace, almost the same, almost the same, like true power. It, it, it has magical effects when it's there, when you allow power to come into your own, in your own being, or you just, you just embody what's already there. So uh, let's talk about the swan. I love, I love it. Sure. Yeah. And I've got a neighbor that's mowing his lawn. So if you hear that, hopefully it'll be over soon. <laughs> Not a problem. But I always have stuff. So. I wish you'd mow mine. Too busy doing this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And the dragonfly, there's more to it than just that little anecdote. And none of the animals in the deck are negative, if you will. Although illusion has difficult energy, but it's got its advantages too. They're it kind of ties into camouflage in that sense. But with what you're describing and how evil works, it's usually evil tricks you into giving up your own power and making you believe that you're powerless. And that's a really great uh, correlation to Swan because Swan starts off as this ugly duckling that becomes something graceful and elegant and beautiful. So one of the things about grace, it has to do with... Uh, feminine power of entering sacred space or enter, entering the unknown or the emptiness, the, the womb of creation, that type of matrix. And I wanted to actually read from this book. It's only about a page of reading just because it's a cool, <laughs> it's a cool myth, if you will. And I really like how it describes the transformative power of grace and will hopefully really resonate with everything we've been talking about up to this point. So, little Swan flew through the dream time, looking for the future. She rested for a moment in the coolness of the pond, looking for a way to find the entry point to the future. This was a moment of confusion for Swan, as she knew that she had happened into the dream time by accident. This was her first flight alone, and she was a bit concerned by the dream time landscape. As Swan looked high above Sacred Mountain, she saw the biggest swirling black hole she had ever seen. Dragonfly came by, and when Swan stopped him to ask about the black hole, Dragonfly said, Swan, that is the doorway to the other planes of imagination. I have been guardian of the illusion for many, many moons. If you want to enter there, you would have to ask permission and earn the right. Swan was not so sure that she wanted to enter the black hole. She asked Dragonfly what was necessary for her to earn entry. Dragonfly replied, You must be willing to accept whatever the future holds as it is presented without trying to change Great Spirit's plan. Swan looked at her ugly little duckling body and then answered, I will be happy to abide by Great Spirit's plan. I won't fight the currents of the black hole. I will surrender to the flow of the spiral and trust what I am shown. Dragonfly was very happy with Swan's answer and began to spin the magic to break the pond's illusion. Suddenly, Swan was engulfed by a whirlpool in the center of the pond. Swan reappeared many days later, but now she was graceful and white and long-necked. Dragonfly was stunned. Swan, what happened to you? He exclaimed. Swan smiled and said, Dragonfly, I learned to surrender my body to the power of great spirit and was taken to where the future lives. I saw many wonders high on Sacred Mountain, and because of my faith and my acceptance, I have been changed. I have learned to accept the state of grace. Dragonfly was very happy for Swan. Swan told Dragonfly many of the wonders beyond the illusion. Through her healing and her acceptance of the state of grace, she was given the right to enter to the dream time. So it is that we learn to surrender to the grace of the rhythm of the universe and slip from our physical bodies into the dream time. Swan medicine teaches us to be at one with all planes of consciousness and to trust in great spirits protection. So this story, just to remind people, this comes from a book called Medicine Cards, which is a tarot of Native American animal medicine. And there are stories like that for each of the animals generally, but that's one of the more interesting ones. And I think the metaphor of the dream time is like, entering psychic space or into a spiritual or astral realm. And this is uh, 
one of our superpowers that we totally lose when we're stuck in the <laughs> different illusions that keep our body from developing the way that nature intended it to develop by self-sabotaging behaviors and or even issues in our upbringing that made us not develop properly. Even the ugliest duckling though could transform into a radiant swan through the magic of entering into a state of grace, which is as we already described, it is seeing the beauty in all things while also recognizing what path would take you further into the harmony. And that's what the surrender is about. Because no matter how much self-deception we practice, we always really know what one or two things that we could do or change or stop doing that if that happened, then we would expand into the next phase that we're trying to reach. But the key is to make the choice to surrender to that. And this is a amazing aspect of life is that we all have free will and we could choose either direction at any time. And we always are choosing. It's not, that's the other thing about grace. It's not like a one and done. You continue to flow in that current. You continue on the spiral path, even when you meet the same challenging archetype later down the road as one you thought you'd already integrated, you have to recognize that it's there to help you and it's empowered to help you to the degree that you are willing to help yourself. Mm, I love that. And where did the story come from? It was um, the the swan. What are you reading from? Oh, yeah. This is the oh, medicine you, you cards. Yeah, like, yeah. 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 Medicine cards. I think if yeah. you just Googled that phrase, you would find this deck. Mm hmm. And there's probably transcripts of the different animals if you're curious about a certain animal. And I like to use that. And I've learned a lot from it. Some of the animals I know very well by now. Mm -hmm. That one is just such a good story. It's worth reading as it's written. And mm -hmm. the simplest of mythologies can be our greatest teachers. Like you said, it doesn't encode fact. It encodes truth. And that is something you just resonate with from within. It doesn't have to be literal. Well, I knew it was actually really important to do this and uh, I'm not complaining, but even scheduling it, you know, like we, we would have these long gaps between the texts usually can kind of go back and forth and you're done, <clears throat> but we'd, a week would pass and and uh, it, 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 even the day that we were going to do it this week wasn't going to work. And I'm, I'm like, tomorrow, should we just like slide this in? And uh, so, yeah, that, that message about surrendering to grace, that's, that is the key that I needed today. So that's what I'm going to take away from this, uh, in addition to all of the, the, the beautiful knowledge that has been spilled, that is much more on the side of truth and less on the, on the side of fact and evidence and, and stuff like that. So uh, I can't thank you enough for coming, Chance. It's been, it's been really beautiful. We don't have to close now necessarily if there's more to talk about. But uh, I just want to make sure to, to say that, that that's the takeaway because, you know, it, it's so easy right now. There's, uh, there's bombs happening at every turn. We're in, we are in a tyrannical state. There's lots of actual threat on multiple fronts. Uh, not, to, not to make you guys worry about me or anything like that, but it's, it's, it's got to that point where, okay, you know, I, I might not actually be able to handle all these individual threads where we started out. And, and the, only, um, the only resort that I have is to surrender to grace. And that's how I, that's, you know, I'll say how I saved my life from cancer many, many ways. And this is, this is definitely one of the ways to say it is I gave my life over. I said, okay, if this is my time to die, I will accept this. And, and I will go into the void if that's what it is. And then, and then it was a complete turnaround for, for having done that, just like the swan experienced came out of it and not, not, you know, completely transformed inside herself. She was a new swan. So yeah, and that is a part of the spiral path is that that experience and process will happen more than once in your life. Uh, but for you, you had a really big one that I think has empowered you to any time that there's a necessity to surrender to the flow that you're like, well, I've already done this before. I've already faced my death. And at that point, what is there to fear about anything, any situation, any tyranny? You're mm -hmm. already living on a time that you could consider as a gift. There's, you know, there's nothing to lose and everything, everything to gain in terms of helping this 
realm out of the state that it's fallen to. And it's not that nature has fallen. It's just that our behavior and our perspective, it's all gotten very sick. And we need to understand how the self-sabotage is the main component. And stealth can help us both to see what needs to be seen and what's below the surface. And it can help us, and that's the part of grace as well, seeing what's really there. And it can help us to avoid um, unnecessary conflicts, like the example of camouflage and just generally, in a simpler word, tactfulness. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And and then, you know, this is a good example. Also, I can't just rest on my laurels from the past. So yeah, I did that. And I point to it often because it is a an entry point into who I am and, and the basis for what I'm doing now. But if I wasn't continuing to prove it to myself, right, if I fit if I if I just bragged how oh I faced my death, and I'm done, I'm not. This is this is this is an ongoing new things, new, new threats, new, new situations that are calling me to have to rise to new levels of my own grace. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's ju just to say that that job isn't done and not, not to give anybody the impression of, of uh, that we don't always have to take the risk of going into the, the, the mystery, not, not the mysteria, but but to surrender over to that and trust God, like Naikas says, right? It's, um, <clears throat> and that's the only thing you trust. You don't trust your government. You don't trust your spouse. You don't trust your anything. It's uh, this, this element of trust. We have it and, and you can enjoy it. You can, you, but, it's, but it's not for if you project it out onto anything, including some concept of God. Because when you're truly trusting God, it's right here. Like yeah, there's no, yeah, there's, yeah, it's ahead. not a character. <laughs> it's not a character. It's not an it's archetype. It's not not a name. It is what it is. It's not and what I am. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, the best words I am, right? Like, and it still doesn't describe anything. But because we both have that experience, then we can use those words and, and uh, have a, a reminder. And that's what we're doing here. You know, we're reminding each other. Uh, that's how we can serve each other of what we already know. Truth is truth. You've heard it. And, but we need constant reminders because we've got so much other propaganda coming our way. And it's really easy to, you know, I caught myself and I have to be stealthy about talking about this, but I caught myself wanting to make a choice. It's like, it's going to happen now and it's going to happen before the summer, before, you know, they, they just totally lock us down in our own neighborhoods or cities and before the food supply is cut and before, you know, and, and I, I was really, all, you know, back in a, in a fear gear. And so now my, my job, I realize I was reminded by a good friend last night, my job is to let that all go. And, and not so I can make a different timeline. It's so that I can see with clarity. Because that's what you don't have anymore when you're, when you're not actually, you know, when you're hiding for all the wrong reasons or, or camouflaging, and there are right reasons for that too. So it's a pretty tricky thing. And we all have to sort through it. And what you're saying to too, that goes back to the spider, spider web is that it's one strand at a time. And if you're looking at the whole big picture of the destination you want to achieve, that can be overwhelming and that can activate that fear response and that panic that, oh, it's not going to happen in the right timing. And then all of a sudden, it's like you forgot that there's such a thing as divine timing. <laughs> and it is the easy thing to do. I mean, there's so many things in our life that we might want to grow faster but the only way that anything is going to grow is if you take the most responsible action one step at a time and realize and recognize the taming power of the small the amazing magic of working on what needs attention most in that order regardless of how big or little it is and not worrying about steps five or ten moves down the line and uh, not necessarily being unaware you know, you maybe there's a good time and place to set down a, a vision board of a five year or a 10 year plan. But in the daily hustle and bustle, you need to just work on the one thing at a time and be single pointed like that. And that can be a great benefit and you gain so much mental energy back when you're not trying to juggle all of those moves in your all those chess moves in your mind and worrying about what the enemy 
they're trying to plan out your move for their move. It's like whenever I used to drive and pass by a police officer, I would sometimes get caught up in my mind of this like whole imaginary situation of they're going to pull me over. They might look for my weed. They might, <laughs> uh, I had this whole conversation. I would map out in my head, like they say this, then I respond with that. And this is before I even knew about law at all. And I realized I was doing it and thought, man, I am getting into arguments with police officers that don't even exist. <laughs> and that applies to a lot of situations. I mean, we get in arguments with people in our mind all the time. I think uh, if we don't practice restraint on that and we should realize that's also part of the stealth thing is if you are constantly thinking bad thoughts or in conflict in your mind with somebody, of course, you're going to carry that energy directly to your interaction with them. But if you notice yourself in conflict in your mind with somebody else, I mean, if it's an imaginary police officer, just immediately let it go because it's unnecessary. But if it's uh, a loved one or a friend, maybe, do the opposite and imagine having a positive interaction with them and what you would like to say to them and what you'd like it to turn out like and see if that doesn't sort of dial down your anxiety about interacting with them and bring you to a greater accord the next time you do. But yeah, I'm good to move towards the wrap up here at this point. We've really done a great job, I think. Uh, I think so too. <laughs> this yeah, was awesome, beautiful. pretty unscripted. I I do want to add one thing to what you were saying is that when when you have to be stealth in the practical world of what could be sensed with eyes and ears and, and you know, red and all that kind of thing, what you can do is communicate at the spiritual level with the soul or the spirit. Like, I don't, I'm not making claims on these words uh, if they are different. And I, I see where they can be different. But, you know, if I can't say something to someone, I can still very much communicate with their soul. And I did that for years with my audience that didn't exist yet. I would talk to them and they were there and they showed me exactly who they are. So it, it was, it was real and it can be very effective too. Like where there's somebody in your life that you can't reveal because every reveal means they have some kind of ammunition against you or they use it against you. You can't be vulnerable with them. Uh, then, but you can talk to their spirit and their soul. I think that's going into the dream time in a way. Beautiful. Exactly. And then a whole different version of you comes out and it's what it's exactly what you said that you can stay much more on the high road, you know, whether that's, uh, it's not positive to whitewash or take away, uh, reality, right? It's not to try to pull the wool over your eye, your own eyes, but you will see a different version of yourself when you're speaking in, 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 uh, in that realm. Yeah, that's true too. It, it is like um, automatic. It's almost like a channeling experience when you do those type of mental exercises. Um, yeah, I I would if I wanted to have a conversation with you and you weren't available or I didn't have my phone and I wanted to know what you'd say about something. I would just in my mind imagine asking you the question and just let whatever popped into my head in your voice be my answer. And a lot of times, if it's not especially if it pertains to me personally, and it's not some specific thing, like what's the square root of 329? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you'd get that one right off the top of your head either. So communicating <laughs> with your spirit, asking that question probably would help, but we have amazing powers and uh, what we can do in that realm of uh, the void is quite limitless, honestly. Mm -hmm, exactly. So what a beautiful reminder. It's been amazing. What are you up to these days, Chance? You have to tell me because we don't get to talk and then everybody else can learn as well. What have you got coming up that you want people to know or not know about? <laughs> oh, sure. Uh, well, first of all, I got to point out just because on the screen, it's interverse.com, but it's actually interversepodcast.com, oh, kind shit. of a long oh, URL. Okay. That took a long time. Okay, let's see. Yeah, oh, I noticed that a while shit. back, but I wasn't too worried about it. Oh, I figured wow. someone that was motivated would find it some way or another. <laughs> But that's really the main thing I'm up to. Uh, do like to interact with my Telegram group. I've been a little quiet on there lately. I think it was like this Mercury retrograde double eclipse thing just really pulled me inward. <laughs> and I wasn't feeling as extroverted. But I go on uh, Unslaved podcast with Tessarion pretty often. I have a recent interview there that I'm super excited about where we talked about biofield tuning 
Mm. Tuning forks, that's something that outside of making episodes of my show, I've been doing a lot of experimentation with and learning quite a bit about how to help reinforce people's energy systems and move stagnant energy. Just the other night, actually, I did a quick fork session that was really meant to just be like a a tune-up and an energy booster. I wasn't necessarily intending to get into the deep roots of any issues. And sure enough, I found a stuck a sticky spot in a place that related to them being about the age of 12. And uh, then later, after we had done the session, this person all of a sudden had like some memories and realizations about how they their relationship with food being connected to problems with their teeth and really bad experiences with orthodontics when they were a kid. Mm -hmm. And long story short, just that quick tune up session with the forks, I was able to guess what age the uh, braces were put on (laughs) in a weird way. And there was more to it than that. But there's amazing potential working with the sound therapy, vibrational healing modalities and I consider myself a novice with it, but I have studied it quite a bit. I think it's not uh, going to sabotage me to say that one of my favorite authors, Eileen McCusick, is coming back to the show soon to talk about this type of subject matter. Uh, I've got an episode coming soon that I'm really excited about with analyzing video games uh, for social engineering and what type of differences our culture has experienced it because of that particular entertainment modality Hmm. and we did a good job going light and dark with that conversation the good and the bad uh, finding grace but yeah there's always going to be new episodes of interverse if you haven't checked in for a while i'm excited about all of them and they're going to keep on flowing i'm on rockfin like you are i've also got a patreon where people can get the extended versions of shows So, uh, yeah, if you guys want to connect, my Telegram group's a really good way to do it. There's awesome community there, just like on Beth's King Hero Journey group. And uh, at some point, probably maybe tomorrow, I'll get back to the rhythm of doing those daily quick reads. They're usually about three to five minutes. Not not trying to tell people what their day is going to be like, but trying to show them the symbols present and let them see how that relates to themselves. And it's just a fun practice for me. If anyone was very, very motivated to try out biofield tuning with me specifically, I would take them on and we can do it remotely. But I also would say that there are tons of practitioners out there that are experienced and take on clients a lot. And I would be just as happy if someone went to them. Uh, I would be thrilled though, to work with anybody on that or with like personal uh, card reading using different decks that I've got. Or if someone just thought that I could help them with something they're going through and they wanted to talk to me specifically, we could work something out as well in terms of, uh, I guess, a guidance session, maybe combining multiple modalities. I imagine that if someone came to me, they would probably leave the the, uh, session with a couple of movement practices and breathing practices, some insight from a tarot session and some tune up from sound therapy would love to combine all those modalities with anybody that was specifically interested in checking that out. So yeah, I just hope to talk to you again sooner than later and find any time that you want to just have a chat with me. I loved this one because it was very much a conversation more than an interview. And uh, we both revealed things from this topic that I think coming into it, we had a loose idea of what the goal was, but we flowed with it and, it all manifested and I don't think anything got left out. <laughs> uh, I don't know if you can stem two questions that came up. One is what does the triangle sure. behind you over your shoulder mean? And also does chance believe in flat earth? I can't, I can't resist it for some reason. Usually I, I wouldn't go that route, but. Oh man, getting personal. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. They're coming for you. Okay. So the art that's directly behind me is, uh, I don't know what this symbol is actually intending. I trust the artist, though. This triangle seems like it's just a meditation on the concept of three and trinities. And then on the other side of me, there's this cosmic egg. I don't know if I can do this very well. 
Oh, yes. Nice. It looks like uh, Basenka, which is Ukrainian. So both of those art. are art from a guy named Hakan from Turkey. There's a friend of mine. And I just really like his work. And I ask for it as gifts. And sometimes he sends me stuff. He's been on my show a few times. Hmm. Just an incredible digital artist. And hmm. I love adorning my space with his things. But the egg specifically relates to the flat earth question because I at least on a metaphysical level, I personally find the most appealing way to describe our realm as a cosmic egg or womb. Mm. And so if anyone looked up cosmic egg by Hakan, H-A-K-A-N, on my website, they would find conversations with him. You could find a bigger image of that artwork. So the flat earth question, I can't tell anybody I know aesthetically what the realm looks like from up above and far out, but I can say that I know liars when I see them. And I know that we've been lied to about everything, especially from NASA. And there's no reason to ever accept once someone's proven themselves a liar 50 times, why accept anything at all from them? Right. It's like opposite day over here. So I'm down with flat earth, um, down with other conceptions. And to me, it's all cosmology, which is a personal question in the first place. I do think that maybe it's a, all right for us to have unique cosmologies. Maybe that's not actually a bad thing as long as what aligns is moralities. But, you know, flat earth is a more parsimonious explanation of what I sense with my own two eyes and my own feet than that we would be spinning through an empty void at thousands or millions of miles an hour and all of that. <laughs> to me, I can disprove the the mainstream narrative. I can't prove, prove anything substantial beyond that, but I'm happy with that. So the long winded answer. Great answer. I love it. No, it's perfect. I'm in the same exact boat. You can't prove the globe to me. There, there's no basis for it anymore. And, uh, but neither am I spending even lots of hours on this, but uh, I know that I like to cooperate with my senses. My, my senses are God given. They are not a mistake. We're not right. They, it, we weren't given these senses so that we can be confused and think we're wrong all the time. Like that's, that's just a way to divorce you from the miracle of this living experience that we actually are. So that's my, that's my, yeah, there's on that. The flat earth question is dangerous too, because you might, people just might not be ready to go there. And if you make it a big part of your talking points, uh, and this goes back to stealth, you could turn people off that might have benefited from other things you had to say that they were ready for. Not that I'll never talk about flat earth. I've got some episodes in the archive on it. If it comes up in conversation naturally, I'm definitely going to talk about this or that element of it. And I'll probably do uh, flat earth oriented episodes in the future because I do love to open people's minds and I'm not afraid of my audience being not unready for things like that. But as a contentious talking point, I think it's done a lot of harm. It's also done a lot of good to people to recognize just how deeply we've been lied to about everything and open their minds to something greater. But it is a sticky on purpose, one of those like very volatile conversation topics. <laughs> It's not one to just open with on the elevator pitch. <laughs> no, exactly. And it's and it's more weaponized than ever. I actually, uh, my kid blurted out to me uh, when we were having an argument one day is like, I, and I bet you're a flat earther. And I'm like, oh my God, where in God, where did you get that? Well, now I know where he got that, but it's uh, it, it's become the biggest insult that you can make to someone. It puts, it puts them in the QAnon category and all kinds of other um, fictions that are held against us and uh yeah so i i totally hear what you're saying I, it's not the it's not the main thing of my platform because it's not my main interest i'm not willing to die on this hill because it's just not my hill there are other hills i'm willing to die on yeah i'll support people that are on that hill though right all day yeah exactly <laughs> exactly and have them on my channel and talk about their subject and stuff like that but we all have our little piece of uh of the freedom puzzle to i totally go to a flat earth festival though that would oh, be yeah. super fun all my friends will be there <laughs> all where's that at will be there uh flattoberfest can i believe it's in um the carolinas is it north carolina i don't think it's south carolina it might be but i know there's a few here that would know uh flat accord music and sue finelli has been to some of the versions do you want to just quickly say karen b is the one that organizes those 
She is uh, one of the hosts of Bitches Brew. And we will be We're back Facebook on, friends. on Sunday. What's that? I'm Facebook, Facebook friends. friends with Karen B. Nice. And yeah. someone said in the chat that they wanted to see you and, and Karen B have a conversation. So that might be fun. She's awesome. Yeah, it would. She'll be on my hit list then. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't think you're very far away from the, the flat festival. So I don't know how far it is from Missouri to Carolina, but oh, right, right. Sorry. I don't know why I think I mean, I'm right in the middle. I know you're in a whole different yeah, same country. Time zone. That's right. If you asked me about central. Canadian geography, it would be pretty bad. <laughs> yeah. We're just space. Nothing going on here. And there's no population problem. Like I can watch my dog run away for like two days. I don't have a dog, but uh, he's not going to bump into anybody on the way. Wow. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, this has been super fun. Uh, you know, last uh, chance to go check out Chance. Uh, just to, to hear, last chance to hear all of this. But you can you can stalk me on Telegram and uh, and Chance on Telegram. I've sh I've shared that link a few times in the. Oh, and there's a link to the Flat Earth Festival, so some people are sharing it, and it is in uh, Spartanburg. Looks like Spartanburg, South Carolina. Very good. Excellent. Cool. So we got the answer to that. Hey, before go we go, do you want me yeah. to hit everyone with some tones? Oh, sure. Yeah, I thought maybe you were going to share a card or something like that, too. So <laughs> I don't have my decks over here, but okay, that's fine. I no recently words. recorded my tuning fork set and added them as buttons to my mixer where I can just boosh, mm. hit some tones. So Oh, fantastic. Okay, lay it on us. We'll do a couple, like not too much time, a minute or so. There we go. How oh, beautiful. It's all waveform. That's what we're dealing in. Coherent sound is what it is all made of. Exactly. Exactly. Coherence is the same thing as grace, really. Mm. Mm. Great ending. I love it. Cool. <laughs> Thanks, Beth. So Had a blast. Thank you. Me too. God bless you. And I hope to talk to you soon. Thanks to everyone in the chat for coming and uh, do share this if you found it useful and uh i'll see you guys real soon don't know exactly when but uh it will be soon <laughs> jenny b says her dog came running cool all right bye everybody <laughs> thanks for hanging out okay bye for now <laughs>